cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. We wanted people that were insanely great at what they did. Nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad. So, um, Ryan, would you introduce yourself? <laughs> me introduce me. That's a new one. Um, sure. This is what happens when you do like the low budget show. I mean, not that this is a low budget show, but this just reminds me. I have these flashbacks of where you show up and they're like, is there someone to introduce me? No. And then you have to be backstage and you kind of think, ah, this guy recently appeared on the Tonight Show. Please welcome Ryan Hamilton. And you run out there and you see people's voices like, I think that's the same guy. Is this like a one man band? <laughs> Did he change so, jackets? Was that it? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, hello. Um, I'm Ryan Hamilton. I guess uh, we've known each other for quite a long time. So this is a treat for me, Jim. And you've always been so great to help me out. And um, I don't know if you want to talk about how we met, but um, <laughs> you, you know, you were one of those people who just came to me and said, look, I'm a fan. And I think I can help you. And I've always been so grateful for the help that you've given me. And you really have helped me so much. So uh, I feel like I'm introducing you now. But uh, <laughs> but that was actually the whole plan. So, so it worked out. Well, I think it's good to have context. So well, whenever I lived in New York, we, we lived in like this area of the West Village. And we didn't know it, but we were lucky in this sense. We were a eight-minute walk to the Comedy Cellar. And I feel like a lot of people go to New York, you buy tickets to Broadway, whatever. In my mind, the Comedy Cellar was literally the best ticket in town, especially for the cheapest price. I like didn't want people to know yeah. about it. But like, first off, how would you like people that don't know what the Comedy Cellar is like? How would you describe it to people? The Comedy Cellar is like the mecca of comedy in my mind. It is the place you want to be. It's just it's also got this amazing energy about it, which a lot of clubs can't capture. I mean, the onstage environment and the onstage experience is amazing. It's got a few different rooms now. It's grown a lot. But the the original Comedy Cellar room, there's some, it's very small. It seats like 90-something people. But the way that it feels when you're on stage is just, it feels great. Like you have a connection with every person. There's a lot of energy in the room. And it's weird because... There's sometimes you think it shouldn't work. Like there's only one bathroom in the whole place. And you have to walk through. And even the people upstairs in the restaurant are walking through to use the bathroom. So there's a lot of things where you think this shouldn't work. But for some reason, it works amazing. I mean, it's the very classic brick wall, low ceiling, basement comedy club. But to me, it's the kind of the iconic one. You know what I mean? It's the one where it's like all the others are kind of based off of this yeah. model. And I mean, it, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, and then upstairs is just this other world where people love to hang out, and you walk in there, and you just feel like, I mean, it does. Like I've always, I think everybody has this fantasy of like, I want my own Cheers, you know? Like, and <laughs> to me, when I started working regular at the comedy store, I was like, wow, I found a Cheers. I can't believe I'm so lucky to have a Cheers. You know, like it just feels like. You know everybody there. There's lots of regulars. You eat. You have dynamic conversation. Interesting people come in. It's just a, a kind of a magical place for me and, and kind of saved me in New York, to be honest. I was yeah. ready to go. I couldn't ha hack it anymore. I wasn't getting on stage. And then I started getting one spot a week there. I got an audition and it made it changed my mind about living in New York. I mean, I love New York, uh, but life was hard there, <laughs> and it made it a lot easier yeah. just to have a place to be. You know, I used to walk by the Go comedy ahead. cell so and think if I could just get on stage once there, and that is now like my regular place. I haven't been on stage in a year, but you know, when I was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that that's I actually want to come to that on like you going to New York and then staying, but like to drive it home with the comedy cellar, it literally is the Madison Square Garden of comedy, the Coliseum of comedy, and. And you go there and it's magical for someone like me because it's like 10 to 20 bucks a ticket. You have to order two items. And all of a sudden you could be there and like, you know, Chris Tucker shows up or Seinfeld shows up or, you know, 
Judd Apatow pops in, you're like, wow, like this is amazing. And they're just testing material. And there is like, yeah. you have to like get a ticket two weeks in advance. There's a wait list. So it's amazing. But when people would come in town, we would always take them to the cellar. And we went like at least like every other week. And what we found was we would go and you killed it every single night where we would look at the list before we would like go in and be like, please say Ryan is on there. So we wanted either you or Gary Goldman. Like we knew it was going to be like an amazing night. And like it got to a point where like, how does the world not know about Ryan? Cause you're, you just like <laughs> killed it every night. And so that's when I literally like, it was probably after like a few glasses of wine, we like emailed you, my wife and I, I'm like, I emailed you. Cause I do like digital marketing stuff. And I'm like, can we just talk? I was like, I'd love to like get a conversation. <laughs> yeah. And you actually like replied, um, not to say people should yeah. email you cause um, whatever, but, um, but it was, it was super fun. But being able to go to the comedy cellar with you, you are like the mayor of that place. Like knowing everybody, it is, it is a cheers, but um, yeah, man, it was, it was really cool to see that. I mean, it's just like all the up and comers of like comedy that um, people would go on to have huge names like yourself, get a Netflix special, but it's um, yeah, it's like the training ground in, in my opinion. Yeah. The thing that I love about the comedy cellar is they really put comedy first. So like if you're not killing regularly, it's kind of like you see it in terms of how many spots you're getting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's, and I love that. It's like, that's what it should be. It's like, and, and there's so much variety there too, of, of different types of comedians. Like you mentioned, Gary Goldman and I, we're both kind of the same tone, but on our stage presence is very different, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so anyway, yeah, it's just been fun to know you since those times. And I, I have, we always have that comedy sort of connection. Yeah, that, that's a special place. So I so I'm pumped to geek out on your writing process because I have so many questions. But first, I want to talk about like I'm always interested in people's like inflection points with their career. So, you know, you didn't grow up being like going to comedy school. You actually had a job, I believe, in PR in Seattle, and then all of a sudden you you make this jump to comedy. Like, can you walk through like the point of like, hey, I think I want to test this. Wow, I might be good at it. I'm going all in because I think a lot of people get nervous and making those leaps and jumps, but you like, it, it looks like you did it quite seamlessly, but I'm interested in like what validated that, like to put in dumb terms that you were funny enough to do this. Um, well, I don't know if it was seamless and it's, it's kind of weird. Yeah. It's, it's hard to explain unless I go way, way back to my childhood actually, because mm -hmm. I, always loved comedy from a very young age. I'm from rural Idaho, I should mention, <laughs> and which is where I am right now, actually. Yeah. And um, in the house I grew up in here, in, you know, it's, it's a very small town, like a thousand people. And, but for whatever reason, I was drawn to comedy. I don't know why. I, I We used to read this uh, Dave Barry's humor column in the Sunday paper when I was a kid. And that was one of the first things that clicked with me where I thought, wow, this guy just gets to sit around and think about funny ideas. And that's his whole job. And he writes them down every week. And I thought, what a great <laughs> job. And then Annie's Evening at the Improv came on cable and I would make my family watch it every week. And it was like this weird world where I didn't know what comedy clubs were, but I was like, there's Bud Friedman, this guy who's kind of like the club owner. And there's this place where people hang out every night. And there's these weird guys I'd never seen before, like people who I'd never heard of, who were just writing jokes and getting on stage. And I, it just locked into my head, like, I just am fascinated by these guys, you know, and I would think about their jokes later, and I would start to write my own jokes. And I would think, I think if he changed that, it would be better. I mean, this is me as like a 14 year old kid. <laughs> and um then I got a. I thought, well, I'm going to start writing um, a, a column in the newspapers, but we didn't have a school newspaper. So I called the county newspaper and they said, sure, you can have a column, which is only a thing that happens in. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, we found right. a new writer today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody yeah, wants awesome. to do it. You know, it's like. <laughs> um which is like a joke I have about a small town where it's like people don't think you get diversity of experience, but you kind of do because you have to do everything. Like no, there is no specialization. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody does everything. So 
I was like this guy who was known as someone who was interested in journalism and writing and but mostly I was interested in being funny for me and um so it just kind of I thought about it for a long time and then when I went to college I'd written this column and then I found this little sketch group and then I was a, a broadcast major and some of us had this radio show and we were interested in comedy and we decided to do comedy shows broadcast in our little tiny uh whatever it was thousand watt radio station or whatever that you know had like a three mile radius on campus and we would do these stand-up mm-hmm. shows we did like four of them and but i wasn't even thinking about it a career it was just something i was drawn to all the time mm-hmm. i went on i studied public relations and journalism graduated got a job at a pr agency which was actually in salt lake city um, not okay. seattle but i did live in seattle shortly after that but um, I got laid off from that job and I was doing comedy just for fun. I, you know, as soon as I had, oh, wait, time, sorry, when you say doing comedy for fun, were you doing stand up at the same time? I was for a short period. As soon as I, I always wanted to do it, but I always was working and going to school at the same time and juggling several jobs and just, I just didn't have capacity. I wasn't thinking about it as a career. I was thinking about something I wanted to do, but I remember the, I finished my last final, uh, and the next I went home, I went back to my apartment. I'm like, I'm done with college. I have a part time job. I called this comedy club there in Provo, Utah that day. Like I finished my final. I was like, I'm calling the comedy club. I have some time. And they said, which is remarkable to me, like this just doesn't. I wouldn't think anybody listening to this don't expect a comedy club to do this i don't know why they did this it was a weird little comedy club that really needed local people they said come down on friday and do some time and i was like okay i would have been on stage like amazing <laughs> yeah so i just started going <laughs> hanging out in comedy clubs as much as i could another comedy club shortly thereafter opened in salt lake city i was there every night and then i was working and doing comedy on the weekends and at night and i was Couldn't stop thinking about comedy. I got laid off. I was like, okay, I'll try to find another job. Didn't have a lot of luck immediately. Got a job as a parking valet. And then I started to just go, okay, I'm going to jump into comedy for a year and see what happens. And so So, that's- So were you intentional where you're like, okay, I'm literally giving myself 12 months to like see if this works, whatever like works means? Was it it that intentional to give like yourself time? Yeah, it was. Well- I didn't say I was going to quit necessarily if a certain thing didn't happen, Mm -hmm. but I did say, okay, I don't have a lot of money. I'm probably going to go into a little bit of debt to do this (laughs) because I wasn't making a lot of money. So um, I did have this other job and I had, I just cut my expenses down to the bare minimum that I could. This is when I moved to Seattle too, because I needed to get on stage every night. And I, Mm -hmm. if I was going to really do this, so I moved to Seattle And I thought, um, okay, I'm just going to evaluate myself after a year. And if I'm not happy with where I am, then I can go back and get another job. Mm. A couple things happened. I wasn't making a lot of money. I was making a little bit of money, not enough to support myself really, kind of, but not any semblance of like a normal, you know, humane life. And, um, (laughs) And, but I did win this in Seattle. I won this comedy competition. Well, I won the industry night in this comedy competition, the Seattle International Comedy Competition. I met some managers and agents from L.A. who were the judges, and they really encouraged me. And I got an audition for some sitcoms, actually, based on this one night. I went down to L.A. Wow. And um, it was wild. I had no idea what I was doing, navigating the business side of this. I made some real blunders, <laughs> just naive, just out of naivety naivete and um i (laughs) but it was it was an experience that gave me confirmation like okay these people who really know the business have kind of encouraged me to keep doing it so that was within that year and i thought let's see what happens in another year and then something else would happen you know wow so that's how it yeah. So it's like those are like those validation points like hey, I think I'm on to something. So you're doing it in Seattle. They're flying you to LA to like get you in sitcoms after like winning, you know, one competition, which it's quite impressive. When I don't know if the next step is like you deciding go to New York because this is where I really validate like I'm I'm on to something. Was was that the thought or like 
like how quickly were you well, going to New York? Well, it was weird because I didn't, I wasn't really drawn to New York right away. I, I was just work. I was a road comic. I kind of, after that became a road comic. Like I had that moment in LA where I got a studio test. Like I was there for like a week and I got a studio mm-hmm. test for a sitcom, which means that you've made it to the final couple of people. And the studio is just testing to see who's going to get it. I had a contract drawn up. I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I <laughs> just signing I, whatever you need to sign. Yeah, yeah, I just had a couple of good auditions, like I, beginner's luck or whatever. And um, and I thought, okay. Do you remember the this, sitcom? Maybe, what's that? I Do you wasn't remember in the it. sitcom? Oh, okay. well, or yeah, like, it, was like, called, it wasn't like Friends or something or something. Really no, it was something icon. that I think <laughs> never made it on the air. It was like, gotcha. I remember Chris O'Donnell was the, uh, the like main anchor lead. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. It was like something brothers. But anyway, I, I didn't end up getting it. But I thought, OK, if I get it, I'm moving to L.A. If I don't get it, I don't have money to move to L.A. I'm going to go feature middle, be a middle act on the road again. So. I didn't get it. And I just started working on the road as much as I could and getting good at stand up comedy. And that's what I was really drawn to. And um, so I was just, I moved back to Salt Lake uh, for a while because it was cheaper. And I just drove all over the country and I took anything I could get for years. I did these terrible one nighter gigs. I did so many crazy gigs, just getting on stage anywhere I could. I really kind of went full time as a comedian earlier than I should have, Mm -hmm. but it drove me to do these crazy gigs. And this was before social media, really. So there wasn't a lot of other options. It was just getting on stage. Yeah. And then um, eventually I got this offer to do a thing for Comedy Central in New York City. And it was called Live at Gotham. It was my first TV experience. That summer I did Last Comic Standing and this show on Comedy Central, like within months of each other. And this was my first time taping any sort of thing for TV. Um, I got off stage. It was also Amy Schumer's first time taping anything for, I didn't know who she was. She didn't know who I was. We'd never met, but she was on the same show I was on. I got off stage. I was first on this. I'd never performed in New York. They made me go first. I was like, (laughs) it was at Gotham, which is so weird to think about now. It's like, I, I live there, you know, but, um, yeah, I got off stage. Amy ran up to me and said, I'm Amy. You're moving here. We're going to get a place together. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's in my head. Like, and I really started to explore. We never got a a place, but she wanted to, you know, be roommates and just do comedy together. She was was (laughs) hungry and she, I don't know. She liked my act and we became friends. And I had a couple other friends who lived there and it kind of stuck with me. Oh, and then Amy and I did Last Comic Standing a couple months later. And she, after that, just skyrocketed. And um, it stuck in my head, like maybe I should check out New York. And, and I started to really explore it. And it seemed like the place to be for stand-up comedians. And there was, I had a lot more connections in L.A., um, the Comedy and Magic Club in L.A. was looking after me and they had said move to LA we want you here and um but I don't know I thought if I don't go to New York now I'll never have a New York experience in my life if I go to LA I'll probably never leave LA if I go to New York maybe I'll go to LA later so I went to New York and it was a temporary thing I got like a sublet for a few months I kept my apartment in Salt Lake which was like so cheap yeah and then um I just ended up never leaving and loving it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I just, the people you're surrounded with there, I feel like is like so contagious and energizing to like keep pursuing. So you go to New York, Rolling Stone writes an article calling you like the, the next great comic to watch, which that's awesome, but also a lot of pressure when they, they (laughs) they put that label on you. You then like you get a net, when did your Netflix special launch? Was that 2018 or 19? Uh, Um, Let's see. I shot it in 2000. Shot it in May of 2017. It came out in fall of 2017. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. and then this leads to all opportunities where you're 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 touring with 
Jerry Seinfeld and Jim Gaffigan. Like, it, but you, you mentioned at the start that there were points where New York was rough and you weren't sure if you were going to stay there. Like, I, I listen, I list off these bullet points. It looks all rosy, but like, were, were there certain points where you're like, this is tough, or like th- there was there was doubt where it got very real, or like, what's oh, kind of the yeah, mindset sure. pushing through that? Well, it's interesting you bring up the Rolling Stone thing because there were many things like that. I, I had a lot of things at these festivals. I would win these little competitions that were industry things. I won a lot of competitions, even though I wasn't like trying to. It was just like the avenue that I had that was available mm-hmm. to me. And I won this thing called the Sierra Miss Next Great Comic. And that was like a national thing. And um, that was before I moved to New York. And then this Rolling Stone thing, they put me on this list, of, like comedians to watch, which had like Bo Burnham on it. <laughs> and like, yeah. well, I can't even remember now. But people that you'd be like, oh, those people we should have been watching. And then I just <laughs> like my whole life, my whole career, even now, is kind of like, I've just been this guy, like, keep your eye on this guy. And I'm like, how long am I going to be a guy to watch? And is this my fault? Like, is this on me that I'm not excelling as much as I should? I had a lot of thoughts like that. I was just working as hard as I could, but it's also like, well, maybe I'm, I don't know. And so New York was getting very hard because even though I had these things, these TV credits, New York is not an open door for anybody who's a professional comedian. It's like, I, nobody knows who I am. I got, I showed up there. The clubs don't really care about you being on TV. They kind of care about what you've done since you've been in New York or like you establish yourself in New York and what did you do as a New Yorker, you know? And then it wow. kind of yeah. becomes something. So I was there for years, just like, not able to get on stage. I would do the little rooms, like the comic produce shows, but getting regular spots at the clubs, which is kind of like why I moved to New York, wasn't happening for years, a few years probably. And it just takes Mm. time. I mean, that's not unusual. That's kind of to be expected, especially for someone at my level who was, you know, not a big headliner, but working and had a couple of TV things. It's just the way it is. And, um, but then uh, I got an audition to the Comedy Cellar. Amy actually, Amy and Anthony Jeselnik got me this one night I was there just hanging out. And they go, have you ever seen Ryan? And she goes, the booker, Esty, who's now just, you know, one of my dearest friends was like, mm-hmm. no, but, you know, do you want to go on? I was like, oh, no, I couldn't. I was so nervous. <laughs> and um, I, I went on a few hours later and it went okay. Yeah, And that changed the momentum for me in New York and the clubs, they kind of look at each other's lineups too, you know, and they go, Oh, he's starting to work here. Maybe we should, you know, Wow, it's like a a domino effect. So like you, you, you get on these stages and it sounds like you have to earn your kind of street cred in New York. It's a small community to some extent Mm -hmm. where like you get in that room, it opens up doors to these others, but then it also like, I feel like it extends your network that leads to, even bigger opportunities outside of the stage. Is that like the platform that opens? Cause the thing that's interesting, like with comedy, it's like, I'm thinking from a business perspective, like what are the paths you go? Cause I'm very naive. It's like, okay, I assume you then like get a TV show or you go on tour and you sell up Madison square garden and, and that's it. Right. Like, I don't know the other options, but like talking yeah. to you and your agent, Peter, it's like, actually you can do corporate gigs and those are, extremely lucrative there's like yeah. all these other things and i don't know if like getting to that status yeah. opens up those opportunities it can be i mean there are, there's so many different paths you find out when you start doing this living in this world and it all comes from different ways i often think you know it's really hard to set goals sometimes as a or as an early stand-up comedian because you really don't know what doors are going to open and you just kind of take you know, what an opportunity and go, this is an opportunity that I have right now. I'm going to run with this. And it may not be the thing that you thought two months ago that you were like, okay, this is the direction I want to go specifically. So yeah. uh, And a lot of it is because of other comedians, you know, other comedians help other comedians. We open doors for each other. 
but there's all these different, you know, like the Netflix special really came, I think, as a result of going to the Montreal Comedy Festival for several years and being seen by the industry there. And eventually people going, um, you know, this guy deserves uh, a shot at this. We like his hour. You know, they needed mm -hmm. an hour, I think, that was in the kind of area where I am in comedy. They, they, they needed that spot. And they knew about me because of that. And they knew that I had an hour ready to go because they'd seen it already. So mm -hmm. it's just a, you never know, you know. And then you get to a certain level where you kind of start to direct more of your own career. And um, that's where I'm kind of <laughs> learning right now about what I need to be yeah. doing, you know, and trying to yeah. um, progress uh, myself. But that's how it happens in the beginning, I guess. Everybody, I always tell new comedians, I go, don't worry when they ask me for advice. I, it's like the comedy end of it is just getting on stage. Everybody has their own process. But the business part is harder to... I feel like I can give advice there where you just go, don't watch what other people are doing. If someone gets something ahead of you or someone, you get something ahead of someone, it doesn't mean a lot because every comedian has a very unique, individual, distinct path. And so comparison is pretty futile in this business. It's like some people get something early and it can be a detriment. Some people get something late that they should have got a long time ago, but it works out in their benefit because now they're more experienced or whatever, you know? So everybody's path is so unique that you just have to kind of trust your gut in making these decisions and taking the opportunities that, that are ahead of you. That's how I feel. Yeah, I feel like that's good advice in general for any career. Like comparison yeah. is like what the the enemy of progress. So I'm I'm mm -hmm. so you talked about creating an hour of content, which sounds so freaking hard. I want to get to that, but first, like, I, can you talk about you went on tour? You've been touring with Jerry a bunch. Like, how did you get introduced to Seinfeld? Who, in like some regards, you could say is the guy, and you're able to like go on tour with him. How did, how does that happen? Yeah, it still blows my mind that I'm able to work with him. And um, I mean, it's strange to talk about these things now because I, the last show that I was supposed to have was a, a opening for Jerry at the Beacon Theater, uh, March 13th and 14th of uh, 2020 in New York City. And, you know, we had lunch and I said, well, <laughs> what do you think? Are we going to have shows? Well, I don't know. The next day he called it a day before Broadway called it. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, so we haven't been on the road. Um, and he, you know, I work with him occasionally. Um, I don't do all of his dates by any means, but I get to work with him occasionally. And it's been just a beautiful, amazing uh, experience to s see him work. We met, um, I was opening for um, Gad El Malay, who is, a, if you don't know, a very f big comedian in France. He actually has a series on Netflix called uh, big in France yeah. which is a thing about his life in the U.S. But he is just a student of comedy and America is really, I think, in terms of stand-up comedy, like, I don't want to, it's just like the place to be, it seems like. So even these international comedians, they kind of keep their eye on America. He's a student of, of American comedy. He moved over here to pursue a career in English, which is just so, uh, I can't imagine starting a second career in oh a second language. Especially and when it's comedy, like the nuance yeah. is everything. Yeah. 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 Oh my God. So he could speak English, but you know, he, it wasn't completely uh, fluent. He was learning as he goes and it was a lot of work, but he knew who I was just because he was a student of comedy over here. And he kind of latched onto me and, and liked what I did. And I love what he does once I got to know him and we became close friends. He happens to be good friends with Jerry and um, Gad did this big U.S. tour. He asked me to open for him at Carnegie Hall, which was the last final show and of this wow. tour. Yeah. And I'd never been on, you know, it was like, okay, I'm going to be on stage in Carnegie Hall with my friend Gad. <laughs> and I just didn't want to mess it up. And Gad's audience, a lot of them are, 
you know, English as a second language. A lot of them are French people here in the States, even though he does have an American fan base now too. But I'm nervous because they don't, you know, they want to see Gad. Anyway, I'm, I've worked with him on the road. I have some jokes for his audience now. And um, I'm there. And Jerry's there hanging out. And Gad says, do you want to meet Jerry? I go, yeah. So Gad pulls me into Jerry's, into his dressing room where they're just hanging out. And Jerry's so accommodating and kind. And and he goes, Are, have you ever been, played here before? And I go, yeah. He goes, you have? I go, no, I've never been <laughs> <laughs> and he's laughs uh, and he's like he gave me some really good advice about these big concert halls where the theaters that we're used to normally have the wings where you can see the mm-hmm. stage manager when you look over but carnegie hall for acoustic reasons is built so that there are no wings there's a door that opens up that looks like the wall and it closes mm-hmm. when you come out on stage so there's nobody. You're alone, and it's a long <laughs> walk to the microphone, which we're not used to. So he told me, he said, this is going to be different than other theaters because of that. And so he gave me this great advice right before, as they're calling me my name, over Ryan Hamilton to the wings, Ryan to the wings. Oh my I'm God. like talking to Jerry. I'm like, I'm going to wait till this is over. <laughs> yeah. I go uh, immediately. I'm like finding my way. I get there. I go directly on. St- I mean, they're introducing me kind of like as I get there. I do this set. I come off stage, and then Seinfeld is right there when I come off stage, and he watched my whole set, and he's like, "That was great, Ryan. So fun to watch." And then we watched Gad together, our friend, at this huge show, and we just, as comedians do, just had fun. Jerry had a little walk-on moment mm. after the show. There's all these people around. I mean, Gad knows a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> and they pull me into the dressing room again. I'm like the last person there. There was like Sarah Jessica Parker here. Um, uh, <laughs> Jessica Chastain here. Like a bunch of people that I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. And I'm the last person in and they close the door. <laughs> And I'm like, and everybody's kind of looking at me like, oh, we saw you too, you know? And, and um, Jessica Seinfeld is, it was there and she's friends with Sarah, Jessica Parker. And she's like, wow, we loved you. You remind me of my husband a little bit. Oh my God. I get like a little red because I heard that before in my life. And I'm like, oh, I never thought this moment would ever happen. (laughs) I'm just trying to be myself, you know, but I heard that. And I go, yeah, I, I hear that from time to time. And Jerry goes, you do? I don't see it. And everybody <laughs> laughed and fell out. And then they started talking about their own things. But I was like, what a moment for me. And then um, a couple nights later, I was at Gotham um, where I did my first TV spot. And Jerry loves Gotham. And he happened to be there that night. He was walking in. I mean, just a couple of nights after this, we had met. Wow. So, yeah. He was just so, he saw me as he came in and he, he goes, come here. And I went over and he, he took me outside in the hall and he just, he was just so complimentary and kind. And he said, we just loved your set. And it's so encouraging to watch people who just love comedy. And he told me so many great things that they had said at dinner when I wasn't around about my set. And he just, you know, was kind and, and, and super encouraging and we kind of just you know it was like oh maybe it was just amazing to me and then a few months later um we bumped into each other a couple other times with gad whatever and he asked me um if i wanted to go on the road with him i got a call from my manager said jerry's got some spots so uh i said let me check my calendar and uh um so it, and ever since then, um, we've just been able to do that once in a while. It's so fun. Yeah. And his, Man. It's just, I mean, uh, yeah. that, yeah. yeah, it's just a great opportunity for me really. And he's uh, so gracious with his experience and his knowledge and loves to talk about it. So we spend a lot of time doing that. Yeah. That's gotta be so surreal. Someone that I'm sure you like watched growing up and like got inspiration from all of a sudden you're like meeting them face to face and having to have like a normal conversation and try and keep your cool. That's, um, but now you're friends. So that's, that's, uh, man, that's amazing. So 
I have to ask. So you're you're on tour with Seinfeld. He's like well known. Like my co-founder, who's like the ultimate like productivity guy. Like not even for comedy. He likes Seinfeld because supposedly he has like he's like a prolific writer, amazing with habits. I've got to think like as you're like traveling with him day and night, like what are you kind of learning from him, absorbing from him as you're like being able to be a fly on the wall as he's doing his work? Yeah, I mean, he is, he really is um, a guy that once you get to know, he has his life dialed in, in a very, I mean, we love to talk about comedy. I absorb all of that, but also working with him, I do absorb a lot of the way that he's able to create so consistently and how he's kind of designed his life to be able to maintain this level of consistent production, you know, and um, all the things that he's been able to do. And yes, he has encouraged me in certain habits and others I've just kind of observed. Um, I have a long way to go (laughs) in this kind of self-development world but it has definitely influenced me um he is very consistent about his life and his writing and his health you know he knows that he needs to take care of himself so that he can continue to work at this level and it's demanding you know um yeah so that's been really a great opportunity for me and i think about it a lot i mean there's a lot of things that i've learned but um, I don't know. In terms of there's like in terms of creativity, I've learned a lot, and then in terms of life, I've learned a lot too. Family is very important to him. That's kind of his first priority, and mm-hmm. um, but he does take care of himself very well, and 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 loves to write. And his creative, some of the things that I've learned. I mean, there's a lot, but some of the things that I've learned about you know, creativity, um, is this consistent way that he's been able to write every day. And, you know, he makes it enjoyable. He doesn't overwhelm himself, but he makes it consistent. So he has a party at his desk (laughs) when he sits down to write, he gets everything set up and it's his time to enjoy, you know, it's not to him seen as this laborious thing. When you think about writing as a writer, it, it becomes, weighty you know it becomes heavy it becomes this burden and he shuns that idea and says as long as you're the point is to have fun you know in the creative process so he makes it enjoyable and that's how you are able to do it consistently for such long periods of time throughout your life that's one thing that i've picked up from him that um, has really benefited me quite a lot because you know, you, you, it's hard to go, okay, I'm going to write an hour every day. And you start to think of it gets heavy. But when you think about it as like, not the um, output, but the act of just doing it, of enjoying the creative process, the burden is suddenly lifted. And if you do that every day, you look back from a year and you go, I created a lot of stuff, you know, and I enjoyed it all. And that's what I think he has taught me. He may or not, I don't know exactly what he would say about this, but I think he would agree with most of this based on our conversations that we've had over time. So, um, yeah, that's one thing in terms of creativity. It's almost like changing that voice in your head on like, cause it's so funny. Like some of these tasks we build up to be so painful in our head, they're not that painful. They don't take as long, but if you can flip the script on it and be like, okay, this is going to be a fun activity. I look forward to it. You can like over time condition yourself to, to like it. And I got to think the output is better, especially when it's writing about fun things. Right. Um, yes, exactly. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah. And your mind gets in this, in this kind of like uh, pattern where it, it expects you to have this little party every day. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's like you need it. Yeah. And uh, 
I am not as disciplined as I should be a lot of times about this, but that is one thing that has helped me become more and more consistent Mm -hmm. that I've really gained from him. Um, You know, but everybody has their own process, but that's one thing that I think everybody can kind of apply to whatever process they have, you know, Mm -hmm. it's funny. It's like, sounds so simple, but it's like really the thing. It's like, be consistent in like those little habits add up significantly. So that, that leads to, so this is what I'm really interested to hear is like, you like, if people haven't seen your stuff, like, please like not to be a complete advertisement for you, but go to Netflix, watch it, go to your website, watch the videos, because the thing with your type of comedy, like I'm interested to see your process. It, process. Is it idea first? Do you write first? But honestly, I, I wonder if it's a third is you're, I don't know. Can I say jokes? Is that what I should say? Jokes? Yeah. Okay. Sure. We'll say jokes. Yeah, yeah. That they have jokes, the, they, <laughs> they have this I, this feeling like after you say it, you're like finally someone said it or someone gets it and they yeah. articulate it better than the way you have said it or you 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 yourself would have said it. Those are my favorite types of jokes. Um and I feel like yours have that component to it. Like when you so I want to know the process. Like and I'm sure there's, it's a very case by case, but like, is it idea first? Is it you just, I'm going to write for 30 minutes per day. Something's going to come up or you want to create an emotion or do things happen throughout the day and you're writing it down and like, where do you write it? Do you have post-its? Is it Evernote? Um, I'm, I'm super interested in like how you keep the idea mm-hmm. machine going. Well, everybody has their own process in this, but I think for most comedians, it's kind of a combination of all of what you're talking about because it's very unique in that it, it's, it's not like a nice thing to have audience feedback. It's like a complete 100% requirement to have audience feedback to create this stuff. So it's a combination and it's a lot of editing, really, uh, when you get down to it. But the, the germination of the ideas, yes, it, it, it comes. I just keep notes on my phone. I also have a little notebook that I keep around the house and by my bed. But, uh, you know, it's not my phone. But so I have both of those. And then um, those things are usually not funny when they're written down. <laughs> they're just like these weird kind of like, this is something a lot of people can relate to. Also something I'm interested in, which is really something I like to think about, which is very valuable in creating these types of jokes. And um, that's kind of where those things start. And then... I sit down and go, I just, how can I, how can I deliver this to the audience? This idea, this weird little premise that I have, like, how can I get it from this principle into, I need a vehicle to deliver it, Mm -hmm. you know? And then um, I kind of map that out. And then I, I have a beat or two where I think there might be a laugh. And then that's when I take it on stage and I try to get to those laughs as soon as possible, but still, you know, supporting the idea with as, as much as I can. So as little setup as possible to get to the laugh. And then if you you see where you get the laugh, but what usually happens is you get a laugh somewhere that you didn't necessarily expect it. You might get a laugh where you thought you would, but you might not. And then you go, And then you go, okay, now we've got this new uh, thing to work with. So it's like, you know, it's like the sculpture you're making, but it's kind of being revealed all the time. And so you go, okay, now you go home and look at it from this other angle. Okay, (laughs) I've got this weird thing over here that I didn't think about yesterday. We got to balance it over here, whatever. And so you start just tweaking it and then you take it on stage again and again and again. And you do that like a hundred times. And then... (laughs) <laughs> for my stuff, I get really lazy where I, I, I've I kind of lived with this idea, of, at least for me, that that process is very difficult. It's really hard to come up with a new premise and get a big laugh at the end. So I end up using the momentum of that to create another laugh and another laugh and another laugh. And I try to just stretch it. And I, I like having these big chunks, you know, and then it eventually turns into like this chunk is what we call it. And um, mm-hmm. that's kind of how it works for me. Um, yeah. 
But yeah, those reactions that you're talking about, like the, uh, you know, the classic, that is so true. And that's what you're looking mm-hmm. for. Like people are always saying that it's like, they're laughing. We're going, that is so true. The, the recognition that like, I knew that was true. I've never thought about it exactly in that context. I'm so glad. <laughs> it's amazing that you recognized it. And yes. it's just the, the surprise that they that they have confirmed this already at some point in their life, but it's never been verbalized is elicits some sort of laughter, you know. I guess. Yeah, I, and I'm interested I'm interested in like you know, you could probably write all day long, but it sounds like the advice I've heard from you say to people is like, get on stage as quickly as possible. Cause like, like you all, you're so good, like at comedians in general, like iterating on feedback from the audience. Right. Cause that's when you really know you're onto something. And I'm, I'm interested in like, what are like some nuanced changes you've made that had like a significant impact? I don't know if there's examples like, or actually, I'll, I'll pause there. Like, is, is that something that like you can think of examples where it's like a little change had a big impact, or is it is it not that that simple? Oh yeah, I mean that happens all the time, and sometimes a joke stops working, and it's such a nuanced thing that you can't you don't even know what mm-hmm. changed. I'm so scared to go back because I haven't been on stage for a year, and people kind of think. No, you just get on stage and you do it. That's what you've always done. <laughs> yeah. But it requires all this kind of like, that's why we don't stop getting on stage because like once you get off, it just kind of, it'll come back. But it's like a lot of this stuff you can't even write down, you know, mm-hmm. it's like the way you deliver the syllable or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of examples of this. I mean, it happens constantly, but um so funny if i was in the process of doing this right now i would have like (laughs) you know yeah but i'm not in the process of doing it right now i'll I'll throw some example like you talk about this idea then the vehicle to deliver it like the you have a great gym membership joke about like you you can only cancel it if you write a letter but then you go to the extreme of like talking about writing letters and then you like become someone writing a letter during the civil war and it's like to go to that extreme to drive because it's like you take this point it's so ridiculous you have to write a letter so it's like you accentuate that to the like the fullest degree but it's like that joke would have been funny with a letter writing joke but then like going that path of like civil war it's i think it built it's that momentum where you take a laugh and it's like okay that's funny how do i like like double down on it i don't know if that was always in there the civil war part but it just like it it takes it to a next level i i'm not certain where that happened either but i I probably would say that happened um, like I had I'd worked on the letter joke and then I bet I was on stage and I just started. I just had this energy behind like a yeah. lot of it's fueled by anger, you know, where yeah. I'm like, I don't want to write a letter. And then this is the letter. <laughs> that, like, I probably started writing a sarcastic yeah. letter on stage at some point. Like, yeah. Dear mind, Jim, you know, and yeah. we like doing the action probably thought, oh, that seems like. Like to me, that joke has always been like the documentary voice that you see. Yeah. And like, you know, there's like, <laughs> you see the letter and the script, and then you hear someone reading who's like an actor who's supposed yes. to be the soldier. <laughs> so that probably popped into my head, and then I just started acting it out. Um, that I bet is how that developed. I'm not certain. I don't remember, but I bet that's how that developed. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. you, you, there's another joke where I love because like not being a New Yorker, but then moving to New York and living there, um, there's a lot of humor in that, and you hit on a, on a lot of stuff that I, like I'm from Oklahoma, and then I moved to New York that that I just loved in the sense that like there's this mentality with New Yorkers, not to stereotype, but like if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, and the idea of the Midwest, and those are the jokes where it's like finally someone said something, and it's like knowing your audience and knowing when to hit on those. So is that like? Because you you bake those into the bit. Are those things you just like annoy? Because it's like follow the anger follow the pain is that like where the humor comes from with those i guess i mean those jokes about i think just came because i i felt it was unique that i was like i was different than a lot of the comedians in new york i Mm -hmm. felt like because i was from this very rural place i was from idaho i landed there and 
I would just, just living in New York, it would be like the ignorance of New Yorkers about what's going yeah. on in the rest of the country. Yeah. Even though, you know, they're very open-minded and everything. It was like, and that's how it was best exhibited was the lack of knowledge of geography. <laughs> yeah. And so it was like, that's something I can latch on to. And it's just very fun to make fun of New Yorkers in in New York. Like those jokes work on the road because everybody knows New Yorkers. But that was a big reason that I really fought to shoot my special in New York City because I knew that that chunk mm -hmm. needed to stand up in, in front of New Yorkers. Like it needed to be mm -hmm. New Yorkers who were... I'm delivering it to. Otherwise, it's it's not as it's not it's kind of like taking pot shots. You know what I mean? It's fine on the mm -hmm. road, but like if I if I'm going to record this, I want it to be in that environment. So, yeah, I guess that mm -hmm. came about um, because of anger. Also, I don't know. I mean, you know, yeah. the other thing that you learn as a comedian is over time is you just kind of develop this. Uh, it's not like you choose things. Sometimes things choose you and who you are is not something you can change. And so eventually it just comes out on stage. And that's one of those types of jokes mm -hmm. is like, it's just me being authentic. Uh, and those are the, the thoughts and feelings that I was having about New York at yeah. that time. Yeah. yeah. How much of like doing a performance is really good material in writing versus how much is delivery? Because I know with certain comedians, like there's some like Dave Chappelle can say anything. It's hilarious. You know, other comedians, it really needs to be crisp and tight. Like as you're testing things, how much of is it like the material versus I can take this to the next level? Not that you're like a physical comedian, but there's physical components to it that are important. Like, is that stuff that you're working through? Because I know like at the seller, sometimes you guys will videotape yourself just to see how you're delivering things. Because it's like, there's yeah. this physical component to it. Yeah, I like to use the whole instrument, you know? Like, <laughs> I like to perform. Like, yeah. you know, it's amazing about stand-up comedy is you don't have a lot of tools, you know? Yeah. You've got you, your body, yourself, your voice your inflection and you've got a microphone and you've got a stand and you've got lights and you have a stage and that's, and then it's like, how do you use this stuff? So mm -hmm. I think for me, it's just a, such a great benefit to be able to, that's why I like doing theaters because I can, I can move more freely. It feels right to move and perform. And um, so, but I don't, I mean, most of the time when I'm, I don't know, I don't really write those things. They just kind of develop like the, even the letter writing thing about the gym membership, you know, to, I remember that it was only just shortly before the special, I was doing the letter writing thing, but then I thought, what if I start marching like uh, the Civil War? <laughs> yeah. You know, so that even was like something where I just kind of developed uh, this character on stage and you add to the humor by, you know, um, using your body and creating even more uh, visual elements, you know, creating this picture using every tool that you have. So that's how those things come about. I mean, we do tape ourselves and watch, but it's mostly because I find that you're, you really are blown away by the things that you're doing that you don't know that you're doing when you mm -hmm. watch yourself. That's what happens when you watch yourself on tape. You go, I can't believe I've been doing like I have. There was a long time, a period of years where I would shake the microphone like this. For some <laughs> reason. Like, I would like make it. I couldn't just. And I finally watched myself enough times and it, it was like I didn't even know I was doing it, you know, and it's distracting. Yeah. So that's yeah. the value recording yourself mostly is that you find out things that you're doing or something looks different than you think it looks in your head uh so you can correct it you know man I, yeah that, that's crazy but yeah i'm just impressed with like how you all how you're able to just like optimize and iterate to get it like just right um so i i'd love to um so one thing you and i like talking about is just like random half-baked dumb startup ideas it's kind of yeah. fun um one thing that i want to hit on is like 
I like I'm an agency owner and I'm like, Ryan, we write ads, we write copy for people. And sometimes people want us to be funny and it's hard to be funny. I'm like, you need to start a creative agency where you just come in and give like a hit of humor and you need to put an insane yeah. price tag on it to be like a hit job <laughs> where like someone wants to like make their campaign funny. And it's like, Hey, you could have Ryan Hamilton. You get people from the comedy seller. You get two hours of their time to drop in and see their writing process and take it to the next level. And like, I think didn't Seinfeld, he did some like advertising campaign writing, right. in in a previous life well, or I, I've, I understand he I know that he he did these American Express ads that I remember a long time ago and um I think that he wrote those yeah um which you know incorporated Superman he's a big fan of Superman so you know I'm sure that I don't know how it came about or whatever but um Advertising is really interesting to me. You know, I used to work at an ad agency myself. I was I did public relations, but once I got to the ad agency, I realized, oh, I was supposed to be a copywriter. I didn't know what I was supposed to <laughs> yeah. role in the agency. And the copywriting guys, those guys' jobs looked really fun, where they're just coming up with ideas. A lot of times, you know, laughter is such a great way to sell something. So yeah, we've talked about this. It would be fun to um I don't know, especially if it's something that I'm passionate about, a product that I, I'm already like interested in and thinking about. It would be really fun to, you know, just ap apply the humor to that and go, here's what I would do for you guys. Yeah. Right. Just it's like. Um, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, I've thought about this forever just because I've been around ad agencies for so long and I work with these guys and I studied this stuff in college. And, um, But yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, I'm an unproven concept. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, well, it's there. There's um, at Morning Brew, which is like an email newsletter. They, I don't know if they still had it, but they had a tone guy where they'd write the actual email of like what's happening in the world today, and then the tone guy comes in and punches it up to make it funny. It's like, oh, really? like you, yeah, you, you, you could be the humor guy, but you charge a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> you swoop in and you take it to the next level. The problem is that the quote unquote funny person at the agency is going to become really insecure because you're like editing all their stuff um but but i think because it's like every everyone wants to have that dollar shave club viral video and people will pay an right. insane amount of money for it so it is validated there's a line item in people's in, in companies income statements to pay for this so anyway th that's that's the first idea so if um if there's anyone listening yeah it's interesting it. you know because we're yours normally we're called on as talent like to be in it like yeah. you know a lot of comedians just we just go to, like, if you're a guy who's a commercial guy, you just go to auditions all day right, and yeah. try to be the interesting guy in the commercial and be the next uh, flow. With the, <laughs> you know? like, the dream job, yeah. Yeah, which is not a bad gig. How, uh, how much obviously. do you think Flo makes? Like, do you have any idea? I mean, she's like... She's up there with uh, the most interesting man in the world. I mean, I don't think anyone's at yeah. that level, but like people know who Flo is. Oh, for sure. I read an article. I don't know her, but I read an article once that I think she she started in New York doing stand up and sketch. Actually, she was a comedian, and yeah, which makes sense. Uh, I mean, you know, you have to be loose and you have to be <laughs> funny for those auditions. And um, oh, I I have no idea. I don't know. I've never. I've been on the road too much to be one of those guys. I've had commercial agents and they get really frustrated with me because you really have to be home like almost all the time because they call you at the last minute and go, there's an audition tomorrow. I'm like, you oh, know, when yeah. you're on the road 50% of the time, they just kind of go, this is too much work. You really have to be <laughs> Yeah. So I've tried it, like, I've, yeah. but I just, it's never worked where I'm just traveling too much to be um, suitable for those agents. But um but yeah it's a great gig if you can get it you know i, I so we're yeah, called on for those things but the other side of the ad i think there's a lot of value that we could bring you know because we are 
focus grouping our stuff every night. You know what I mean? If you want to look at it like that, it's like we know what resonates because we're constantly, that's all we do. We just constantly try things. So I think the value that we have is this experience that we bring from just being on stage every night and you get a sense for what is going to work. Like you're not always correct, but over time you hone this ability to be like this, this is, this is going to hit, I think. And it's, I think there's some application there maybe, you know? Yeah, I mean that and it's cause you even mentioned that you like work with other comedians to like fine tune and act. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's like you and three other people that have Netflix specials that were all just on like Fallon or whatever, like together brainstorming ideas like that <laughs> in itself, scrap the agency, give them two hours of the comedy writing room that they get to just brainstorm with. So all you have to do is show yeah. up and like iterate on right. ideas. Um, yeah. But, but then you'd have to be home to be able to... Actually, we could do it from the road, so you're fine. Um, okay. Yeah, so there we go. Um, the, the other thing, like, so I, I... Like, your show here in Seattle, pre-COVID, you perform in a theater of, like, a thousand people. Then afterwards, you, you go downstairs, and there's, like, 150 people lined up to just, like, say hi to you and shake your hand. And it was painful for me to see that you don't sell merchandise. You don't have t-shirts. You don't have mugs. And people were making their own shirts with your quotes on it. And, like, tell, talk to your agent, Peter. It's like, you're leaving so much money on the table. And Peter's like, I, I know. And he has, like, a guy for you. But, like, <laughs> y- you almost need to have, like, this merch company that, like, because c- it could be so easy. For, there, There's, like, Teespring and things out there. But, like, how do you make a merch company that can make products that are almost, like, unique? unique to you but you could like scale it but anyway i feel like because yeah. there's a lot of comedians that like do some really f- like fun merch that i think is pretty lucrative right probably i mean yeah i think some people make a lot of money i um i don't know why i've never done it i, I have always thought if i had something i really loved and we've talked about this before like almost something like it's not just an excuse to buy something from me you know it's not like I just want to buy something from him. So I, I'm going to buy this t-shirt that I probably never wear. Maybe he'll sign it. Mm-hmm. I, I've i always thought I want to put something out in the world that's like valuable to people. I don't know what mm-hmm. it is. So I've always, um, it's always held me back. That's the thing that's held me back from merchandise. Like if I had a book that I wrote and I was proud of, I would love to sell that on the road. Mm-hmm. Um, something like that so yeah a book's just, a good idea but then you gotta write it but yeah that would that would do pretty well yeah i had this idea now that we're just brainstorming i mean we're giving away all of our great ideas now but, um, <laughs> we'll cut uh, it we'll cut it yeah. <laughs> i had this idea to do uh like a magazine just one episode of a magazine but it's all written by me and it's got like reviews of things that i love places i love um maybe a short story I wrote, maybe an interview with someone that I want to interview. And mm-hmm. it's just like, it's packaged like, like us weekly or something. It looks like, but it's yeah. all, it's, that would be a fun way to deliver something to somebody, but all these things require work. And uh, <laughs> I still, th- I mean, I think you should do a weekly newsletter, quarterly magazine, and one, it's just a great way to keep the fans engaged, but it could be fun. But to the point on merch, I yeah. do agree you want to put something cool out in the world. But like we went to Cannon Beach over the summer and like we love Cannon Beach. I literally bought the mug because I just wanted something from Cannon Beach. And so every time I, I drink coffee from the mug, I'm yeah. like, uh, I, it's, it's my go-to mug. So I think people would want the similar thing, like put on my Ryan Hamilton, you know, flip flops or yeah. what, you want to have the quote on it. But um, OK, so right. yeah. 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 So here's the other thing that like blew my mind. And I sent you this article when I found out about it. So, so cameo, we need to talk about it. So uh, if people don't know, cameo essentially allows you to get a personalized video from a celebrity. Uh, It could be maybe an A-list celebrity. It could be like a Z-list celebrity, but you can get a video. Um, I actually just got one for my friends that I like played basketball with in middle school from we this will say a lot about me and growing, growing up in the suburbs of Oklahoma, but from bone thugs and harmony. Um, so late lazy bone recorded a video for 99 bucks. Wow. 
and he did a really wow. good job. It was thoughtful. He used, I just, you get 20 seconds. I record a video to him to ask him what to say in it. And he took all my notes. Yeah. He had his music in the background. He had his like Grammy awards in the background and recorded wow. a video. And my friends were like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. 99 bucks. I would have paid wow. probably two ninety nine for it. So there's this article wow. that um, Kevin from the office makes a million dollars a year from Cameo. So I ran the numbers for you. A million bucks means he's doing <laughs> 5,000 videos a year. So that's kind of a lot because he's 199, one, 195. So that's 14 videos per day. But the videos are like a minute, maybe two minutes. So that's under an hour of work. And you can see his library of videos. They're kind of similar where he does some of the same jokes over and over again because it's not like these people are watching all of his videos you're just watching the one personalized for you right. so you could literally have a dedicated right. set for birthdays bar mitzvahs like whatever right. that is um but here's the thing so i think you could so kevin he was probably like the 10th guy on the office so granted the office is like the most watched show on netflix so his reach is pretty good but i mean if you do i don't know three to four a day, that's a quarter million dollars. And like, you've got the email list, you've got the Netflix special. Um, anyway, I, but I also think I like Kevin from the office now because I watch his videos and they're funny. Whereas before I'm like, wait, who, who's the guy from the office? So I think it's a good yeah. brand awareness play for you, but then, yeah. but then you have to do work, which we've decided we, we don't want to do. <laughs> I'm coming off very lazy, aren't I? I um... How long are Kevin's videos? They're like a minute and a half. They're thoughtful though. So I think you like, the, yeah. I think your problem might be you'd want it to be like really good. You might like, yeah. or actually, but you're like so good off the yeah. ca cuff. You, you could bang these out really quick. Uh, I maybe, but I, uh, yeah, I do have that perfectionist thing where this is a real <laughs> problem with me in this content <laughs> delivery age that we live in because I'm constantly at battle with, putting stuff out that I don't think is good. It's like, this is nothing. What is this? I don't, it's a constant struggle for me that really is probably hindering my career <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, the way that people find you is, is just, it's more about consistency than it is about quality really. And so I have a difficult time with things like this, but, and the cameo thing, it's just, I those guys I I just feel like how many people are between me and my fans? <laughs> like Every, yeah, many, everybody's getting a cut. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's getting a cut now. It's like, uh -huh. what did you guys do really? Yeah. You just created this website. I'm sure it's you know, there's a business that you're running. It's a nice website. But, it's a nice website. Yeah, it's, I'm sure it's good <laughs> and everything, but it's like <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 if I'm not passionate about it, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was the gut reaction I had when I was struck with the opportunity to join Cameo. I just thought, <laughs> ah, I'm just going to be like, I'm, I know I'm going to turn, like, I'm going to, it's going to be like homework for me. And I'm going to yeah. be like, you want what you want to have it okay have it. i'll be nice because people are i mean i'd be overwhelmed if anybody came if i had three to four a day i would blow my mind i don't think i would even get close to that maybe i'd get one you know like one a month or something but <laughs> so they have reaction videos where you can they film the reaction of the person and like Watching those is hilarious because everyone's surprised. Like, wait, how do they know my name? It's, it's, uh, uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I'm sure it's a thing that maybe that'll be it. Maybe, maybe in the future, the tale will become so long <laughs> that we will just do individualized shows one on one. <laughs> that's it. This would be like, yeah. all we'll do is sit at home, I'll do a very high priced ticket with three yeah. people their living room and then i'll just do that every day and, uh, <laughs> I'll have a oh. 
<laughs> oh my god yeah well i yeah i'm just constantly because it's like i can't imagine being a, a stand-up comedian like wanting to break through today it's almost paralyzing with all the channels at your disposal disposal which is good and bad to like oh you need to be on twitter you need to be on instagram oh you know tiktok's happening okay now it's clubhouse yeah. it's it's like quite exhausting you know that you said something yeah. where it's like it's about consistency to get recognized, which I do agree with. However, I've seen some examples with people that have like blown up their following by actually just being like, all you need is like one to two hits that are uh, potentially viral and have a huge referral component to it to get people excited. And so that's something I'm like yeah. kind of obsessed with. Like for us, like working with startups, it's like, how do you actually like engineer virality? Um, and it is like the 80, 20 rule of like, a small number of these posts or whatever are a breakout success. Like we have one startup that just did like 1.5 million in sales on the back of one video. They invested a lot of their eggs into that video, but it's like, it's gangbusters. So it's, um, yeah. it's such a hard balance. And I'm sure with you, it's like, you know, you get on the tonight show, that's a huge hit, but it's like, how do you engineer something yourself that doesn't have that distribution channel to, to get recognized and to get out there. But yeah, that's, yeah, uh, that's yeah. exhausting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think if there's any comedians who are listening to this and wondering what to do about it, I feel like as a comedian, your main job is to just keep creating whatever it is in any format, even if it's not put out into the world in any way at this time. If you just keep creating, there will be opportunities to use this stuff somehow, somewhere. You won't even know. I mean, there's like so many pitch meetings you go into where you go, okay, we're not interested in that, but what else do you go? And then you go, <laughs> well, you know what? I had this weird idea and I wrote this thing about it and they go run with that. You know, it's like you just keep creating. And if you stop creating, that's when things get scary. But if you just keep creating, you will Find a venue for it eventually. Somehow it will become valuable. And there's so many ways to do that now, which is so cool. And I don't want to be down on Cameo. I'm just saying that. Was my <laughs> but I'm sure that, yeah. you know, for some people, this has been like uh, a big boon and it's been great. And, and, and they feel this energy. They are able to connect with their fans and that's cool. So um, I don't know. Who knows? But uh, my I know I, is, I sound like I, I'm I'm getting a kickback from Cameo, so I'll, I'll stop no, pushing it no, so no, hard. No, I just no. it, it's a magic moment using it. I was blown away. It's pretty funny. Oh, that's cool. I'm glad you had a good experience with it, and maybe I would enjoy it. Who knows? I mean, I have this kind of I'm like the opposite of an early adopter, whatever this is, where something comes <laughs> out. And go, Are you kidding me? No. And then like six months later, I'm like, well, here I am. I guess. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not serving my career well but that's just my personality i guess yeah well it's tough because sometimes it's a home run but most of the times it flops it's like well that was a waste yeah. of time Cre creating my vine channel and my vine following so yeah <laughs> um so i i um i like leaving with like the last question which is like kind of a, a fun thing but like and I actually didn't give you a heads up on this, but like, what is the nicest thing anyone has done for you in your professional career, especially with a career where like, it's kind of dependent on breaks and opportunities and people giving you confidence, whether it's like getting started or even like the break at the comedy. So like, can you think of like any, like one person or thing someone did that was like the nicest thing someone did in your career? You know, there's been so many kind things. Um, I'm just trying to think what would be something really that stands out. I mean, maybe Gad, you know, Gad just he's such a big star. And the first time I met him, he he I he just came up to me and said, "I really enjoy your work in this kind of broken English." I had no idea who he was. Yeah. And I said, "Thank you very much." I went and sat down. <laughs> Yeah. Some people go, do you know who that is? I go, I don't know. And he's just standing there. And then we run into each other a couple more times. And he has been, um, you know, I have a lot of friends, but he's been a guy that um, I can call on like family or something, you know? So um, 
just knowing that that is really great. But I'm trying to think of something really great. I mean, he um, what well, one t- one time we were on tour and I was just uh, for no reason we were just like on tour and he followed me into my dressing room when we got to the theater. He's like, what's that? And there's this really nice, beautiful, very expensive piece of Ramoa luggage with mm-hmm. a bow on it. And he's like, I think that's for you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and it was like a gift to give me a gift, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was for no reason, a really, and I needed it, something that he knew I needed and just was like a cool, that just made me feel so good, you know? And um, uh, that's one thing that pops to mind. I mean, and the moment with Seinfeld that we talked about earlier, the, the the very kind things that he said to me out in the hallway of Gotham were just like, kind of like, you know, he doesn't need to do that. And it was, it was authentic and it felt like it was such a boost to me. Um, that was very, very big. And, and Amy has called me so many times in my career. It's like, you need to do this, do this, do this. She's always trying to get me to do things that she knows. <laughs> like we're yeah. different kind of tones. So she's always offering this stuff. <laughs> where I'm like, I don't know if I can do that. And she gets such a kick out of it. But she's also helped me with so many things. Um, there is this like support system built in within comedy where people help each other. Comedians help each other. We have our managers. We have our agents. We have, you know, these people. But the comedians really look out for each other. It's quite amazing. Um, it's such a small community and every comedian has been helped by another comedian somehow. So it's not like it's even going out of your way. It's just like naturally what we do as comedians. So, um, yeah, those are just a few of little things, but, uh, there's been, there's been a lot. Yeah. There's been a lot. Yeah, that that's yeah. pretty cool. Like just getting the compliments from Gad and Seinfeld. But like the thing about Gad giving you a piece of luggage, that's something my wife and I talk about. It's like we need to be better friends. Like not just give people a gift on their birthday, but like just because. Because like you know you get gifts on your birthday, but it's when somebody gives you a gift out of the blue you remember. So now I'm gonna like stop giving yeah. birthday gifts and like do like the random February gift because it's much more yeah. memorable, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I've been wanting to do this forever. I think this every year around. Uh, the holidays it's like we all give each other gifts like it but there's all this pressure and like wouldn't it be so much better if we gave all those people the same gifts but just when we were inspired to give them the gift yeah so it's like, not force yeah <laughs> yeah we were inspired and and you know as long as you're getting each of those people within the year somewhere it just seems so much and it's so much more fun to receive something when you're just like what yeah. this is just tuesday <laughs> <laughs> Like, wow um so yeah you're right i i agree with you there yeah well right um, i'm sure i'm sure we're gonna finish this and i'm gonna think of like three other just <laughs> blowing kind of like kindnesses that i have received um so i'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have done so many good things for me but yeah no, that's awesome. Well, I cannot wait till we're in a world where you're back on tour because I will say I saw you in February pre COVID. Wait, yeah, that's was that pre COVID? Well, it definitely was. Like, I don't know if it was 2020 or 2019. You came to Seattle, and I've seen you quite a bit. But I'll be honest, that was your fastball. That was like the best I'd ever seen. You're like, not that you're like. I don't know when your prime is, but it was really good. I know this because my mom has the loudest laugh in the world. She was sitting next to me in the theater and people were turning around looking at her. She was laughing so loud. I was like, mom, I know Ryan's funny, but we've got to, we've got to take it down a notch. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was, it was such a good show. I can't wait for you to get like back on tour, but um, yeah, that that, that was a good time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. You've always been so supportive and you've always helped me so much talking about kindnesses. I mean, you have just, for no other reason than just because you wanted to and, you know, helped me so much. So I'm so grateful for everything that you've done for me too. It's been uh, really great. I'm glad we've got to spend some time together over these years. No, it's a blast, man. I always love seeing you perform. So it's fun. Um, Where, like, where could people find you? Where do you want to point people if they want to see your stuff (laughs) or want more Ryan Hamilton? 
Um, I mean, right now it's pretty sparse. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I am not great like with social media. I mean, I'm the most active on Instagram and I like connecting with people there. So that's uh, where you could probably find me the most. Uh, Ryan Hamilton with my name <laughs> with me. <it's>, um, <laughs> I have a website. I have this email list that you have helped me with. And if people want to sign up for that, I will let them know when I'm on tour. Um, RyanHamiltonLive.com is where you can find that. And um, and uh, also you can find me on Cameo. Uh, Cameo <laughs> Uh, it's my full-time gig. Bre- breaking news. <laughs> yeah. That's all I do. I do. Um, I do three dollar cameos, <laughs> eight hours a day. And that's how I get money. Yeah, yeah. Get, get yourself a nice mobile home with all that income. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, well, that's awesome. Well, Ryan, this was super fun. Thank you so much, man. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Yeah.